It is curious that on the 400th anniversary of one of the greatest civilizational and religious events, the publication of the King James Bible, we should invite Frank Schaefer to speak at the library. Uh, for Frank uh, is in a deep and perhaps uh, obsessive debate with the Bible, particularly the uh, more prescriptive parts of the Old Testament. Uh, I want to say that this is really the beginning for us uh, of what we hope will be a larger engagement uh, with uh, religion uh, and uh, in all its aspects, in all its voices. We see the Kansas City Public Library, we believe all public libraries ought to be a place where every voice sings in the choir, uh, where all, all points of view uh, are, uh, are heard. Um, one of the, and most librarians believe that, we all believe in the, in the, in the First Amendment. Uh, and most, of the, most librarians believe the First Amendment applies to political speech or Judy Bloom talking about sex um, uh, or, or Lois Lowry's uh, darker, darker moments. Um, but they are afraid of religion. There is, in fact, a debate going on on the Missouri Public Library Director's Listserv right now about how to exclude religious groups from the library. Now, isn't that interesting? You know, if you, if you read the First Amendment, of course, it actually says the amendment pro uh, uh, prohibits uh, making of any law respecting an establishment of religion, okay, the separation of church and state, but also impeding the free exercise of religion. And it seems to me that one of the, one of the purposes of the public library is not, is not only not to impede, but to encourage uh, debate, discussion, even worship uh, of all kinds, uh, and, and, and to bring it to the public sphere uh, so that we can all know what each other are thinking about uh, and, and discuss it. So you'll, you will find that as we go along, we're going to have more voices. Uh, Frank's voice is the, is the first we have explicitly in this conversation uh, on religion. Uh, we will give uh, himself equal time. Sorry, Frank, I know you're a believer, but um, uh, uh, we have, it being the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible, we, we are having an exhibit uh, and we'll have a series of programs on the King James Bible. Uh, uh, we're getting an ALA, NEA, ALA, American Library Association, uh, exhibit on the King James Bible in July, next July. Um, and we'll, you'll see a series of programs on that. We've talked about doing a series on science and religion, which I think is a great topic. Uh, we don't want to fear any voice being heard uh, in the library. Uh, and so I want you all to, to know that. Uh, Frank's uh, uh, background, of course, as many of you will know, you've heard him on the radio, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, he's been on Steve Kraske's show. Uh, some of you have read his, his books. Uh, has been, as a part of the religious right, indeed one of the people who invented uh, the religious right. His father, Francis Schaeffer, uh, being one of the leading evangelical theologians uh, who uh, was there at the beginning of the, uh, the Right to Life movement. Um, and, and, uh, and Frank himself can tell you, uh, either in his talk or in questions and, and answers later, about his engagement with uh, the Graham family, Billy Graham, uh, with uh, the, other, uh, the other leaders of, uh, of, of the religious right, of the evangelical uh, movement in the United States over the years, and, and about his, uh, uh, his, his coming to terms uh, with that. Uh, but the book that he's going to talk about tonight is uh, uh, Sex, Mom, and God, um, and, uh, uh, and, and is really a very personal book. He told me, he, he said to me before, before we came in, uh, that he's found himself uh, late in life, like, like many of us, uh, like me in some ways, uh, and uh, that, he, that he published his first readable book, I think he said, he said to me, when he was 39, a novel that he published when he was, when he was 39. And these books are, are, are eminently readable. Uh, the books that he's written about, uh, about how he separated from the, uh, the right to life movement and the evangelical right, uh, and about his views of, of Christianity, his views of his family, which in this book are, are, are truly fascinating. Uh, so it is, a, it is a pleasure to introduce to you uh, Frank Schaefer. Thank you for coming out tonight, and thank you to the Kansas City Public Library for inviting me to this magnificent building, which has to be the most beautiful uh, public library in a downtown city anywhere in the United States that I've been in. What an amazing building. <laughs> Isn't it fortunate that banks go out of business so libraries can move in? <laughs> there are going to be a lot more libraries soon. <clears throat> 
But in any case, I'd also like to friend, uh, thank my, my good friend, uh, Charlie Broomfield, who is a buddy of mine who brought me to town, uh, who is my host and who uh, excels at hospitality. Um, uh, and the wheels are greased literally and metaphorically by fine barbecue when I come here. And so <laughs> all is well. Uh, that's what I had for lunch. So I'm in a very good mood, um, and I'm ready to believe anything you tell me at this point. Let me, uh, let me begin tonight's talk by doing um, something that is a shortcut for both of us, and that is I'd like to read from uh, Sex, Mom, and God, and I would like to read from the prologue and just sort of give you the first taste of the book as an introduction to also my talk. The first thing I'll do is read the, the subtitle of the book, which is How the Bible's Strange Take on Sex Led to Crazy Politics, and how I learned to love women and Jesus anyway. <laughs> um, when you open the book up, you see a picture of me next to my mother, Edith Schaefer, um, back in 1959, and we're planting the garden where I grew up in Switzerland in a little mission called Labrie Fellowship. Uh, my mother is an extraordinary person, a very beautiful woman, inside and outside, and I open the book with a picture of her. So before you read anything of mine, uh, you see a little boy staring at the ground, wondering what you do with dirt and seeds, and then you, you go into the book, but you see a beautiful woman uh, in the glory of her motherhood looking out at you, and that's how the book actually begins, for those of you who aren't looking at the page. And then you come to the prologue, which I will read to you, and then uh, offer some thoughts, and then we'll have some questions and answers. One of the things I love most about being with my grandchildren is that they only know me now. So before I explain why I had sex with an ice sculpture and how my family helped push the Republican Party into the embrace of the religious right and chronicle my family's complicity in several murders, let me say that my granddaughter Lucy has just turned two. She, along with my three other grandchildren, is my second chance now that I've carved out a spiritual identity as dramatically eclipsing of my former self as if I disappeared into a witness protection program. My four grandchildren, Amanda, Benjamin, Lucy, and Jack, notwithstanding, I'm still prone to label people and ideas as my mother labeled them. Mom divided everything into very important things, say Jesus, virginity, Japanese flower arrangements, lust, see-through black lingerie to be enjoyed only after marriage, and everything else, say those things that barely registered on my mother's to-do list, like homeschooling me. So I'll be capitalizing some words oddly in this book, such as sin, God, love, and girls, and also words like him when referring to God. I'm not doing this as a theological statement, but as a nervous tick, <laughs> a leftover from my Edith Schaefer-shaped childhood, and also to signal what loomed large to my mother and what still looms large to me. Blessedly, Lucy and Jack live only a few hundred feet up the street. I walk to their house every day and collect them for playtime. When it's Lucy's turn, she perches in my arms and talks to me. Jack is six months old and pulls my nose and laughs a lot, but isn't saying much yet. Lucy likes to be carried when we stroll back to Ba and Nana's house. I'm Ba, and my wife Jeannie is Nana. Lucy's big brown eyes scan the 18th century clabbered houses of our New England neighborhood to see which of the ubiquitous American flags are wrapped around there above the front porch flagpoles by the wind bar and which are waving free in the ocean breeze. When we get to my house, Lucy commands me to read The Tale of Two Bad Mice by Beatrix Potter. It's a story about two deluded mice Hunka Munka and Tom Thumb, who mistake a dollhouse dinner laid out in the dollhouse's miniature dining room for real food. When they discover that the lovely looking ham, fish, and pudding can't be eaten, they smash up the plaster food in revenge and then spitefully ransack the dollhouse. When she wrote the book in 1904, Potter couldn't have known that her classic story would someday be an allegory aptly illustrating the delusion suffered by members of the American religious right. <laughs> Some people who helped lead that movement, including me, were very much like Hunkamunka and Tom Thumb. We lived lives informed by beliefs that were not based on fact 
and that led to deep-seated resentments that couldn't be cured because what we resented never actually happened. We took it as a personal insult that the real world didn't conform to the imagined religious facts that we'd been indoctrinated to believe in, and so we did our share of smashing. My late father, Francis Schaeffer, was a key founder and leader of the religious right. My mother, Edith, was herself a spiritual leader, not the mere power behind her man, which she also was. Mom was a formidable and adored religious figure whose books and public speaking, not to mention biblical conditioning of me, directly and indirectly shaped millions of lives. For a time, I joined my dad in pioneering the evangelical anti-abortion religious right movement. In the 1970s and early 1980s, when I was in my 20s, I evolved into an ambitious, successful, in quotes, religious leader instigator in my own right. And I wasn't just dad's sidekick, I was also mom's collaborator in her mission to reach the world for Jesus. I changed my mind. I no longer ride around saving America for God, nor am I a regular on religious TV and radio these days. Nevertheless, like those two bad mice who later felt remorse and so put a crooked sixpence in the doll's Christmas stocking to pay for the damage they'd caused, I'm determined to acknowledge the destruction I contributed to before Lucy grows old enough to inherit the vandalized dollhouse that she'll soon discover lurking beyond her childhood horizon. So that's how Sex, Mom, and God begins. Now, I'm an author, so the reason I'm here is to sell you books, but I also have a talk to give, and so I'll combine the two efforts and see what the result is. The best way to describe the journey toward writing Sex, Mom, and God is to talk a little bit about the passage of writing that led to writing this book and put in context some of the things I'd like to talk about. In, uh, in 1989, 1990, I started working on a novel that was published called Portofino, which since has been translated into nine languages, got a lot of good critical uh, acclaim, and was really the first, as I mentioned uh, earlier, readable book, or I didn't mention, was in the introduction, which I'm also claiming credit for because it was a good introduction. Um, <laughs> but in that story, I kind of nibbled around the edges of this story of my family by talking about uh, a, a child who at the time is 11 years old at the beginning of the trilogy called the Calvin Becker Trilogy, which is Portofino, Zermatt and Saving Grandma, and um, this, is the, uh, this is Portofino, the first uh, of, the, of the trilogy. And in this book, I began to tell stories about what it was like to be embarrassed by God, which is a common experience of people who are embarrassed by their parents, who in turn are living godly lives, which embarrasses the children, because in my case, it meant that we went on vacation to Portofino, while the Church of England kids from the UK who came every year, and while the Italian pagan Roman Catholics <laughs> who were all lost and going to hell but didn't know it because if you're part of the whore of Babylon, you're in deep trouble, um, you know, would make their sign of the cross or just eat. I sat watching the olive oil run into the rest of my antipasto and the peppercorns float out of my mortadella and so forth while the flies gathered because my mother said terrifically long graces because she viewed her time in the Pensioni Bahia on the Paragi Bay next to Portofino, up the street from Santa Margarita, four hour train ride from Switzerland, where by the way, if you're gonna be called to be a missionary, go there. The tea rooms are great, the food's good, and there's medical care. <laughs> that said, while other people were tucking into their mortadella or their pastini and brodo, whatever the first course was, mom would preach to the assembled pagans and lost people uh, who we knew were lost because they didn't come to our Sunday church service that dad posted a big placard on the bulletin board of the hotel saying there would be a Presbyterian reformed service in room 11B. No one would show up, so we would just open the windows and sing all the louder. But to be an 11-year-old who liked the little Church of England lost pagan at the other table, and her first attentions to you is to stare at your family while you wish that the earth would swallow you, is an interesting introduction to the whole idea of evangelizing and witnessing. And essentially, a work of humor, Portofino, then Zermatt and Saving Grandma came out of that time in my life. And I got letters from people who wanted to know how biographical these books were. And they were in the sense that they 
used anecdotes and characters from my childhood, both my parents and other missionaries I knew in that kind of odd collision of the 60s in Italy, La Dolce Vita, the world of Fellini, et cetera, et cetera, with Calvinist evangelical Presbyterianism uh, that came straight out of Pennsylvania and the Chinaland and Mission. And this was a collision of cultures, the like of which has not been seen since recent events at the UN. So <laughs> but my view was that if you're embarrassed by your parents running for a bus and you wish you'd be like other people and show up on time, imagine this picture. So anyway, those were my first three works of fiction. And a lot of people found them very amusing, and still do, thankfully. Um, and uh, they got quite a following. Interestingly enough, I talk about the fact in the book here of something that I think will interest you and shed some light on this new book of mine, Sex, Mom, and God, that I put in an author note that I'd like to share with you about those first books. Um, when uh, last year, uh, I was writing this book, editing it. I went to Switzerland, where my mother's now 96 years old, and sat down with her, read her some passages, and asked her permission to tell these stories. And while she has short-term memory loss in terms of what she had for breakfast, she's as sharp as a pin when it came to anything about her memories of growing up in China when she was in the China admission and so forth. And so her permission was not something I took lightly even though she wouldn't remember we had talked the next day, she knew darn well what we were talking about. And I, I talk a little about this in the context of this book, because this book is really about not making generalizations about evangelicals and right-wing Christians based on theology, because some of them are much better people than their ideas. And my mother was one of them. Blessed hypocrisy, I call it. But we'll go into that in a minute. However, to introduce that thread in the book and just give you an idea of how wonderful my mother is, I'd like to add this before we move on. Just before Christmas of 2010, we sat down together during a week-long visit, and I told mom about the project in detail, including that I was going to, quote, tell the truth and let the chips fall where they may, mom. Coming from me, my mom understands those words mean something. Uh, she's, as you will see. Um, with a flash of her old self and a familiar defiant head toss, mom said, go ahead, I don't care what people think, and I never did. <laughs> Given her memory problem, I should add that before it developed and before her eyesight failed, she read my other equally, quote, scandalous writing, including my novels, Portofino, Zermatt, and Saving Grandma, and nonfiction works, which also drew heavily from memories that to some people might have seemed too private to share. Mom isn't some people. I once got a letter from one of my mother's followers telling me that, having just read my novel Portofino, a work of humor where the mother character Elsa Becker is like my mother in some ways, that we sh she was sure it would, quote, kill your mother because of the hatred for Jesus that drips from your satanic pen. <laughs> Coincidentally, that fan letter received in early 1990 before, in the early 1990s, before I was using email, arrived, and you just have to take my word for this, in the same post delivery as a note from mom, who then did have all her marbles, asking me for another do dozen signed hardcover copies <laughs> of that book so that my mother could send them out to more of her friends. <laughs> Mom's follower had signed her letter, repent, exclamation mark. My mother signed her note, I'm so proud of you attempting to unravel the mystery of how my mother managed to have attracted such fans and who she really was and is, a life-embracing free spirit, nagged me into writing this book. So that brings me to what this book is about. It's about three things. Sex, Mom, and God is, first of all, about Edith Schaefer. It's a tribute to a woman. Uh, three women have shaped my life. Um, my mother, uh, my wife, Four women have shaped my life. I'm a dyslexic who never did do math, right? <laughs> my, my mother, my wife, uh, and my daughter. My mother, I tell the story in this book, my wife uh, that I got pregnant when I was 17 and she was 18 and we've been together for the last 41 years. And no need to applause, you know, it's, it's the luck of the draw and she's a nice lady. Um, <laughs> if she was here, I'd ask her to stand up, you could applaud her, but believe me, this schmuck is not worth the applause. <laughs> My wife, because she stuck with this schmuck, uh, in all seriousness, this Calvinist, hot-headed idiot 
She thought she had married an artist who wanted to make movies. The next thing she knew, we were on Jerry Falwell's borrowed jet, and I was the keynote speaker at the Southern Baptist Convention. And talk about uh, a bad trip for a, uh, for a former literal San Francisco hippie princess who had once dated one of the drummers in Santana. Um, <laughs> this is really not what she signed up for. So she's wonderful, and she, she uh, for my life, three ladies. And then my daughter, Jessica, who was born to this teenage schmuck, and uh, has forgiven me, and with whom I have a deep and powerful and loving relationship that is centered in both of our faith, that there is such a thing called mercy and grace in this world. And so I have always paid tribute to my wife and where I have mentioned her, my daughter, but I felt my mother had received the short end of the stick in my novels and become an object of humor. And so while she didn't object to them, I did, which is a weird way to put it. And I wanted to put the record straight and say, well, you've all laughed at Cal Elsa Becker in my novels. Let me introduce you to the real Edith Schaefer, who is such a magnificent human being. So one of the points, not taken in any particular order that runs through this book, is that let's not make generalizations about each other. There are people who come labeled as right-wing evangelicals who are literally the salt of the earth. And there are progressives who are about as progressive as Stalin. And there are progressives who have religious fervor that would put evangelical missionaries to shame and love God, some of my lesbian and gay friends, for instance, and who have everything to teach us about acceptance and love and charity and tolerance, the shoes of whom I'm not worthy to unlatch, and I hope I'm in their shadow on Judgment Day. This is a big, bright, amazing world. And generalizations, or to put it another way, certainty kills. No one ever bombed an abortion clinic or a mosque after yelling, but I could be wrong. <laughs> and I think that sort of sums up the difference of my philosophy now and where I would have been speaking 40, 35 years ago to you uh, about all my certainties of who the bad guys were and the good guys. I know who the bad guys are. It's what the Greek Orthodox Church, where I happen to go to church every Sunday, teaches, and that's me. And the rest of you are your own problem. There's only one bad guy in this room, and the Orthodox prayer that says, forgive me, the chief among sinners, says it all. You're not my business. My problems are my business. Judging you actually puts me in the wrong light. And it's taken, you know, 40 years to get there, so another 20, I'll know another thing, and I'll come back and tell you what it is. <laughs> but this book follows the thread of a woman who's better than her theology and deserved a better theology and lived a better theology. And I'll just give you one example that I talk about in the book that really impacted my life, the teenager who gets his wife pregnant uh, when, well, she wasn't my wife. That was the problem um, <laughs> with the Christian community I was in but was received and helped and nurtured with the love that has stuck with me all my life. So people read these books and they, especially evangelical critics in the media, they say, oh, you know, he's denied his parents' faith and so forth and so forth. No, I have affirmed it. I have affirmed the faith of Edith and Francis Schaeffer who took a 17-year-old boy, gave him home for five years while he sorted it out and was a young parent, showed me for a start how to be a grandparent. Every time Lucy's in my arms, she's not just in my arms, she's in the arms of my mother and my father who taught me how this is done. And so, uh, far from rejecting that tradition, I affirmed it. What I rejected was that I feel the, th the theology they were shortchanged with. And that brings me to the next thread of this book, and that is a, a lens put on one life being mine, very egocentric, but on the other hand, I haven't lived any other life, so how am I supposed to explore other people's lives? So I've written about mine, and my life happens to be a life that in some ways has been similar to millions of Americans who have been homeschooled or in enclaves, kept away, sheltered in some way, who then try to make sense of the world and wind up voting for people uh, like Michelle Bachman and think that the appropriate way to launch a presidential campaign is with a prayer meeting. And we laugh and we say that's the wrong way, but believe me, if you had been listening to Old Testament biblical stories at your mother's knee from the time you were newborn, and this was told to you as absolute truth that was literal in every way, and if you rejected an iota of this, you'd have to question your eternal destiny, you might have been slightly screwed up. And so uh, have mercy if you think you know better, because we all are given a certain path to walk. And I was raised on these stories, and I understand them, and I escaped. And so part of my story is that it is possible, and a lot of my email backs this up from other people who have made the similar journey, to change your mind. 
That's a very different concept these days where everybody's not only sure, but lines are so divided that one group watches MSNBC, thinks that's the gospel, somebody else thinks Fox News is the gospel, and then twain shall never meet. And in a world where that's happening, and you can only imagine when it comes to theological differences how even further casting concrete is, a, a, a memoir or a book like Sex, Mom, and God that talks about the fact that you can change your mind politically, religiously, in terms of tolerance and other issues, I think is perhaps uh, something that it might interest this, uh, certain people who, who feel that maybe things are too much boxed off and walled off these days. So that's another thread. But it happens, and it's so odd to me, by the way, a little footnote, that people come to me and say, well, why would you write about something like this? What are you trying to say about your parents or the, the world you live, you know, this whole thing, why would you do this? And I say, you know, look, I'm a writer, and if I had been adopted at birth by a Gary, Indiana steel worker, I'd be writing books about that. And then you'd be coming to me saying, why are you setting all your books in steel unions? Because you only have the life you have. So obviously, it's an absurd question to say, why are you writing about this when this is the only life you've lived? And my life is a life that, for better or worse, worse mainly, happens to intersect the rise of the religious right in America, which also happens to have ruined the United States. And so it's not something, it's not something that is, is coinc it is not something that is peripheral to our country right now, it's central. It means that there are 87 freshmen sitting in Congress who are more interested in shutting down the US government on an ideological extreme uh, of uh, being dedicated to small government no matter what it does, even if it destroys the world economy, puts it into a double dip recession and crashes the whole economic future of the Western world, then they are in listening to any actual economists. And these are the same folks who tell you that global warming is not real, that we don't have a problem. And by the way, we do. I live next to the Merrimack River and I've only been there 31 years and I can tell you what parts of my lawn aren't growing anymore. And all the old timers who've been there their whole life will tell you where the water used to be on the marsh and where it's now. It's real enough. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, these are the same folks who keep their kids home. And if they're just moderate evangelicals, they tell them that evolution is just a theory and that actually, you know, they're teaching them creationism. If they're a little more further down the path towards this sort of Michel Bachmann school, they're telling them that the world is 6,000 years old. And if they're a little further down the path, they're telling their daughters the same thing that those daughters are hearing in Saudi Arabia tonight, which is to stay home, you listen to your father, and we will basically tell you who you're going to marry. And that's the whole quiverful movement combined with the far-right homeschool movement that comes out of my friend's ideology, people like Rousseff Rashtuni and Gary North, and then uh, people who I actually talk about in Sex, Mom, and God help put on the map, who were the first people to write about some of these issues after my mother was writing her family books, and I talk about discovering one of those authors. So the book, Sex, Mom, and God, is literally what the subtitle says, and that's how the Bible's strange take on sex led to crazy politics and how I learned to love women and Jesus anyway. And I'll work back. Um, Jesus had to be separated, in my mind, from a political movement before I could even consider looking at the teaching again as anything except an appendage of a system that had failed. And that's a serious way to put something that's put in a funny way on the book. Love women, well, I was raised on Bronze Age mythology, out of which Islamic misogyny, Christian misogyny, and Jewish misogyny came. And it's no use beating around the bush and saying, oh, this is a misinterpretation. The Bible is full of misogynistic teaching. And it runs through the New Testament and the nice part of the Bible, just like it runs through the Old Testament. And you just deal with it. And uh, thousands of theological texts have been written, most of which, like all theology, is an effort to make excuses for a very bad God. Now, <laughs> let me say what my book says. It's a little different. I'm not Christopher Hitchens. I'm not an atheist. In fact, one of the books I have out on the book table for sale tonight is the third book in the trilogy, the first being Crazy for God, my memoir, uh, subtitled How I Grew Up as One of the Elect Helped Found the Religious Right and Lived to Take All or Almost All of It Back. The, uh, the second book in the trilogy is called Patience with God, Faith for People Who Don't Like Religion or Atheism. And the third book is Sex, Mom, and God, and Love Jesus Anyway is the way the, the uh, subtitle ends. For, you know, I, I think that where Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins and the new atheists go totally off the rails, and I won't go into this tonight 
uh, although I have some patience with God on the book table, and I hope you get the whole trilogy for lots of reasons. Um, <laughs> to do with the fact that you've got to pay for check baggage now. Okay, that's the reason. <clears throat> Um, that's what the literary life has come down to. It's not what it's cracked up to be, let me tell you. And I'll be thinking of each one of your faces as they ask me for $25 for each of those boxes. But anyway, never mind about that. And I'll tell Lucy who you were. Okay, never mind about that. But um, I'm not Dawkins or Hitchens because, you see, I think they make a mistake. They attack religion and think they've attacked the idea of a god or a creator. They say religion is dumb. Yes, it is. Religion is man-made. Yes, it is. Religion is full of schmucks and done awful things. But so has everything else. You know, secularism is not what it's cracked up to be either. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I was part of the 20th century, and I remember standing at the Berlin Wall and seeing guards that would shoot people who ran away from a worker's paradise. So <laughs> they... There's not a very good argument for secularism when it comes to having done a better job with anything. You know, people like Pol Pot and Mao Zedong are not poster kids for another philosophy. So here's the thing. We are all in the same boat. The human race is an eye blink away from being single-celled creatures in the mud who know nothing, and now we're a little further down the road, and we still know very little. But that doesn't mean that when Lucy puts her arms around my neck, and looks into my eyes and says, I love you, Ba, that something deeper is going on than simply a biological continuity, and that the only reason I sense something in my soul is because she shares some of my gene pool. I don't believe that. I could be wrong. But I sense that there is a spiritual dimension that is a tremendous mystery, because we're biological machines living in a cold and silent universe who look at that universe with eyes of appreciation, which is what art is, which is what literature is, which is what love is, which is why Jeannie's forgiven me for 41 years and I'm so grateful and I understand the value of it with every day that passes. So that when Hitchens and Dawkins attack faith by dismissing religion as dumb or showing where the Old Testament is misogynistic, the reply is not to defend the indefensible and say, oh, it was a great idea when Moses said that God had told him that he had made a terrible mistake and God was angry because they had spared some of the women and children when they slaughtered this tribe and they could have kept the virgins for themselves but they were told to kill everyone else. Basically, the response to Moses and that God, who in the book, by the way, I call the God of the Bible as distinct from any actual deity that might be out there, he, she, or it, is important to make. And so for me, the defense of faith has to start with trying to say, and I say trying to say, not claiming that I've said it, what you are not. And what I am not is someone who is saying that we are stuck with the Bible or we're stuck with the stupidity of Christianity or Islam or Hinduism. And so my perspective that I bring in this book in terms of the, the, um, the view of religion finally as it impacts politics and where the God trilogy, as my publishers call it, uh, crazy for God, patience with God, and sex mom and God go, is to say don't throw out God with unauthorized biographies about the deity. It's not God's fault that there's dumb stuff in the Bible or the Quran or other writings about him. It's just the fault of Bronze Age schmucks who were finding ways to control their wives and daughters and who in hindsight were trying to say, see, God made us do it, so it's okay. I say that kind of thing, and Jeannie tells me where to go. She's smart. She would have made a good theologian. And she would have told Moses what to do with his idea that you can keep the virgins, little girls like Lucy, by the way, my granddaughter, uh, because they'll belong to you as slaves and, and chattel property in a Middle Eastern context of tribal warfare, but kill everybody else. And when you get to the New Testament and women are told to sit down and shut up, there's no way to weasel out of this by saying, yeah, but on the next page he says they're like Christ in the church, and so it all comes out even. Uh, that just leads to Hitchens and Dawkins saying, you're all idiots, and they're perfectly correct. But that doesn't mean that a God who loves me and loves my granddaughter and created love and personality and relationships in a universe that otherwise would be dark and cold is not out there. Now, that's a discussion. It's a different discussion. It's the one I have in Patience with God where I have done one of the few things, and that is write a book that was attacked immediately on Richard Dawkins' website and on, on uh, Focus on the Family simultaneously. 
both managed to do that, managed to do that, managed to do that. And so, so I feel it's not a question of triangulating truth and the position is somewhere between two idiotic premises. Both are stupid. Why? Because we can't know anything. I know that now because every day that passes, I realize that I've been on an arc of changing my mind about things and that to say that salvation would depend on correct knowledge is like saying that my relationship with my daughter Jessica, who's now 41, who's always the same age as my marriage, by the way, that's one good thing about getting your <laughs> wife pregnant. <laughs> It's the only birthday I can remember. <laughs> but it's the same thing as saying that, that our relationship could not grow out of an angry teenage father who was lashing out at the world and slapped his little girl to his eternal mortification. And that when I sat down with her and wept and begged forgiveness as an adult, maybe I had learned something and grown. And when she forgave me, she had too. And so there's hope that we can learn along the path. And so if salvation is correct doctrine, then everyone is lost because let me explain something to you in case you don't know it. Life is not long enough to conclude anything. It's only long enough to try your best along the way, learn something, and keep growing. And if you don't know that now and you've got any gray hairs anywhere on your head, you're deluded. And if you don't have gray hairs yet, save yourself a lot of trouble. And uh, just listen to me. And look at this, look at this 59-year-old grandfather and say, there for the grace of God go I, but maybe he's right. Maybe these fiery resolves I have that reformed orthodox doctrine or Roman Catholic this or this liturgy or the other is the only way to go and everybody else is wrong and so forth and so on. Believe me, you will someday arrive at a point where you know that was dumb. And so when people ask me, and what I write about in Sex, Mom, and God, Crazy for God, and in my novels, is an arc of growth and change. Um, and one of the characters in Zermatt, for instance, the last novel in the Portofino Calvin Becker series is someone similar to my father and I show that he changed his ideas. People ask me, oh, what would your father think? And I have to say to them, well, which Francis Schaeffer are you talking about? The Francis Schaeffer who came to Europe in 1947, a Calvinist pastor hot out of seminary who had all the answers, you know, with these young guys, you know, getting out there to evangelize. The, uh, the hippie guru in mid-1960s who was hanging around with people like Timothy Leary, who came to Labrie and quoting Bob Dylan a lot more than he was quoting Jesus, or the religious right leader flying around with Jerry Falwell, who if Jerry Falwell had ever visited his ministry 15 years before, he would have called dad a heretic and thrown him out, if for no other reason than dad's welcoming gay people to Labrie and even letting them room together. <laughs> knowing but not knowing, we see but we don't see. And according to his theology, this was all terrible, and he was a heretic. So who is Francis Schaeffer? Well, take your pick. The, the founder of the religious right, driven there mostly by the ambition of his son, as I talk about in Crazy for God, mea culpa, uh, because I needed a job, and the income directing uh, evangelical movies was better than trying to make it as an artist, and this was a good cause to latch on to, plus we all actually believed it at the beginning. The person who at the end of his life was despairing of the direction of evangelicalism and died rather in despair of what he had spent his life putting his energy into in terms of the movement. I'm not saying his personal faith. That's something totally different that I wouldn't know. Same with me. I have evangelicals email me, furious emails quoting, you know, but you said, you know, in your book in 1974 or whatever, Dr. Dobson, I gave a gift to Dr. Dobson who gave away 150,000 copies of one of my evangelical screeds called A Time for Anger. This was before I was writing real books. Um, <laughs> you don't need editors for screeds, by the way. It's very easy. You just hammer them out and God told you, so it's all fine. <laughs> and the typos are the printer's fault. Um, <laughs> But in any case, uh, you could pick and you go along there. So part of this book is the trajectory of change. So Sex, Mom, and God is about the fact you can change your mind. It's a history of the religious right. It's an explanation of why people like Michelle Bachman, Sarah Palin, Rick Perry, and the Republican Party has now taken over entirely by the religious right, by the way, in case you haven't noticed, uh, by, by people who are leading it who are either members of the religious right or pretending they are because they've got to check off all the boxes on the litmus test. So either it comes out the same. Um, you know, this is the place we're in. So, you know, 
the, the books I've written, the, the, the God trilogy, uh, Patience with God, Sex, Mom, and God, Crazy for God, tell a story that unfortunately is wrapped up with my family. Um, and Sex, Mom, and God, I think, puts a luminous, uh, a luminous touch to it in that um, I'm not applauding my own writing, although I'll do that if you want me to, but um, <laughs> the luminous touch is my mother. So I would just like to conclude the remarks before I take some questions by saying once again, including me, it's easy to speak in generalities. But much as I dislike the politics of someone like Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman, who was quoted in the New Yorker recently as saying she got into politics because she saw the movies I directed, which is interesting, um, I feel like that first scene of Young Frankenstein where he's stabbing himself with a scalpel saying, no, no, Frankenstein, that's not Schaefer, that's Schleffitz, Schleffitz. It's a different, <laughs> different name. Um, but in any case, uh, it, the, the story here is a trajectory. So Sex, Mom, and God is about these three things. It's a family, it's a child growing up and changing his mind, and sadly, in that context, it's the story of the rise and decline, the rise of the religious right, and the decline of the country that it is so impacted. Uh, because there's a direct relationship with what's happening worldwide with our economy right now and people who are in Congress who are ideologues and not politicians anymore. Um, you know, whatever happened to good old pragmatic corruption, that would have been the day. Uh, <laughs> so let me conclude these remarks and say that we're going to have a discussion and I beg you to keep your questions fairly short. I promise I'll be at the book table to sign books for those of you who buy them. Yes, go ahead. Right. They, they aren't that person. Well, the, uh, the question is what allowed me to change my mind? And you were saying people like Michelle Bachman or your minister cannot change their minds but your, or your father. But um, literally in this case, you know, the title is Sex, Mom, and God. Uh, my mother was someone who, including in her old age, and even when she was raising us, could live in two worlds at once. Look, I tell a story in this book and also talk about it in Crazy for God. At uh, age 17 or so, my mom was um, auditioning for a Broadway show as a dancer, and she was cast to come down for an audition in New York from Philadelphia. But her parents forbade her because dancing was wrong for Christians, and her life went in a different direction. But mom never lost that interest in art, culture, music, literature. And so, just to put it bluntly, mom read me real books. I mean, this is an evangelical mother who read me Lord of the Flies out loud and Brave New World, and 1984. And, this, and I had a father who was not afraid to discuss Aldous Huxley's Ban the Bomb movement and why he disagreed with it, but he didn't lie about Aldous Huxley. And he didn't say that there was no use studying science and shelter your children, or let's not look at art. So I may not have drawn the same conclusions my parents did, but in a way, I think these books actually defend the reputations of my parents far more than the evangelicals who say they are following them now, because my dad would throw up if he met Michelle Bachman. <laughs> and she might say he was following, she was following him, and so he would say, well, you know, let's, let's discuss something. You know, what are you basing your politics on? And this kind of truncated religious right pap that is the sort of Francis Schaeffer for morons that has been become part of the mantra of the religious right is so far away from the spirit of the Saturday night discussions my dad had with the very people that she hates that it would just blow your mind if you could if you just trust me and picture 1959 all those beatniks sitting around our living room uh, filling it with such a thick cigarette smoke haze um, people taking drugs in the 60s and so forth and not getting thrown out of Labrie. It was a community that was open and caring about people, and in the midst of that, Dad held forth his witness. Okay, now agree or disagree with that witness, he was not a bigot. And a politics of hatred and exclusion would have been something that sickened him. And I can remember a little bit of that when Jack Kemp called me up a few years before he died and said, you're well out of the religious right, I'm glad you left it. And this was Congressman Kemp, who was Bob Dole's running mate, he said, they're going to destroy the Republican Party. And uh, he hadn't changed his views, but he knew where this was going. And, you know, I knew William F. Buckley. He used to come to tea at my dad's house because he had a chalet over in Gestad. Doesn't that sound terribly British royals and decadent? But we didn't have sex or anything. It was just he came over for tea. <laughs> and so I'm not actually a British royal. Um, but, but 
you know, can you imagine him in a room trying to have a discussion with Sarah Palin? I mean, his best friend was Gore Vidal, and they would debate on firing line and go down to a bar and have a couple of drinks together. Uh, you know, Buckley always used to quote Winston Churchill to me when I started doing a little public speaking. He says, you know, a good speech is never given on ice water. Make sure they give you two glasses of wine before you say anything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is not your typical evangelical. And by the way, nor was C.S. Lewis, a, a high church British Anglo-Catholic drunk. And uh, a high living, you know, Don, so agree, disagree, like his books, don't like it, but the busloads of American tourists that go to his shrine make about as much sense, you know, he'd hate them, they'd hate him if they ever met him, <laughs> and, uh, and the two shall never meet. And the same with Labrie, you know, so it amazes me that I'm cast as this critic of my parents, because I am a critic of them, for instance, my father striking my mother that I talk about in this book, forthrightly, but my dad was a critic of his own behavior as well. And, and, uh, and, and so the funny thing is, you know, my father's philosophy was always try to tell the truth and let the chips fall where they may. I may be wrong, but I've not stepped out of that tradition. And, and uh, th I think that needs to be said because people cast things in these black and white terms, and I don't see it that way. I see it as part of a progression from which I'll, you know, continue to, to grow and move on. Yes, question by the door. Sure. Let me, let, me, let me cut you off there because I have to repeat all this. The question is what about things sort of like the Tea Party line about the debt limit and everything that it's about legitimate questions? Look, my bill buddy Jack Kemp and I spent many weekends in his house talking about supply side economics and at one time I actually believed it and wrote a book called uh, something about Christian Christ's economics or so, something I knew nothing about, typical kind of thing. <laughs> mainly and got Jack to edit it. Been there, done that. Those are all legitimate discussions. But if you want to have, you know, look, I got one other book on the table out there, and I only have a few copies, but it's one that became a bestseller after Oprah had me on to talk about it, which is, by the way, a very good thing. Um, <laughs> keep, keeping Faith, a father-son story about love in the United States Marine Corps. And uh, first of all, it's a really good book. But secondly, I mention it in this context because Having sat at home waiting for phone calls from a son who was in Afghanistan getting shot at, having served there twice and once in Iraq and once in the Horn of Africa, for a president that I knew personally, being George W. Bush, whose mom used to come to Labrie, being Barbara Bush, and, and uh, actually uh, Laura Bush got up on uh, Meet the Press and read a paragraph from this book, which also helped. I shouldn't have broken that bridge. That was stupid. Let me make a note to myself. <laughs> Write a note to Laura. Um, Speaking of librarians, by the way, terribly nice lady. But my beef with the religious right and these, the, the Tea Party is not necessarily the financial issues. What do I know? Uh, my beef with them is that I happen to know that the person who started an undeclared trillion dollar war that was not paid for by raised taxes and who nobody was asked to serve in except a few volunteers like my son who had signed up just before 9-11 was not the president to whose meetings people carried loaded assault weapons and had bumper stickers on their car from Psalm 109 praying imprecatory prayers saying, let his days be few, the next verse is which, let his wife be a widow, and they didn't, and I have friends in the Secret Service, and I learned this from the Boston Globe, but a buddy of mine who's still there told me this, you know, in the first year of the Obama presidency, the threats on his life went up 400% compared to any president in the record keeping since 1952. So let's be frank. Let's be frank, we live in a country that has racism to its core. And that doesn't mean everybody who is, that doesn't mean everybody who has been against Barack Obama is a racist, but it does mean that the fury of people willing to shut down the US government and make a mockery of our economy and drive us into a recession so that Obama will fail are not doing this to just anybody. They're doing it to the first African American president. And that's part of the story that has to be told, I believe. That's one issue. The other, yeah, I think it changes the math because, you know, if you look at somebody like Jack Kemp or you look at the conservatives who came out of the conservative party at that point, they would have been all over the case of, first of all, Ronald Reagan, who came into office, uh, who came into office when we were supposed to have a debt limit and then left office with a $4 trillion deficit. You know, this issue is not Obama's issue. This is the issue of both parties. So we're not going to turn it into that debate, but I think that that's a completely valid point. What is invalid is members of the Republican Party saying on day one, not only uh, not shutting up Rush Limbaugh for saying, I hope this president fails as a lack of patriotism, 
but also then saying that their job is to make this a one-term presidency and doing everything in the book to make it fail. And that's my point of view. And let me just say that when I saw the debates in 2009 over the health care package, and I heard all the language recycled out of the anti-abortion movement, like death panels and everything we had predicted, which were absolute lies, just like the birther movement and the rest of it, it had, you know, talk about deja vu all, again, all over again. The, these are things that I had seen in their nascence now coming full fury, and so, you know, Fox News' audience, the underinformed, all these people, uh, you know, the, the mentally handicapped America that does not have an interest in facts anymore, Rupert Murdoch, what he's selling America is just what he sold the British in News of the World. It's just scum, and it's scum directed at an American president uh, by, by people who are literally carpetbaggers who have come in on a media avalanche to change the tone of American politics, and they've succeeded. And you know what? If Jack Kemp was around, he would tell Rupert Murdoch just where to go. And so would Barry Goldwater or any patriotic American. <laughs> so my, my point is that the point you raise, which could be perfectly valid, has been buried by a politics of negativity that has so, in my mind, discredited the right in this country that, uh, you know, that they, they are, you know, as the son of a, as the father of a Marine, I resent people who hate the United States of America. I'm a patriot. And so for people who say their job is to take down the U.S. government, defund it, defund its programs, uh, 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 make sure that billionaires are paying less taxes, that government is not regulated because uh, abortion is bad, the Supreme Court allows it, ergo, they use the argument to get people to vote against their own interests on these kind of spurious uh, moral claims that then when it's in power they do very little about, you know, the whole package is ugly. So yeah, there are the real issues, but wow, with friends like these, if, if people hold those actual economic interests and issues close to their heart and want to see something done about it, the package that it's coming in is so horrible right now that it reminds me, because I happen to have been around for uh, long enough to know this, of my friends on the left in the Weather Underground and the SDS in the 60s who hated this country and who wanted to shut it down. And it's exactly the same spirit. And I resent it as an American and as a patriot and as the proud father of a Marine. Uh, it's not the world I want to live in. It's not the kind of debate I want to have. Yeah, right there. Right. Well, the way it got, who hijacked this view and turned it into a thing where if you're a Democrat, you're not even a patriot? And I'll have uh, just a couple more little questions, then we'll wrap this up. Um, nobody hijacked it. What hijacked it is very simple. When you put a theological twist on anything, the person who disagrees with you, therefore, is lost. Do you understand? So you got a whole different ballpark here. And what's happened is, is we have, if I can coin a term, we have theologicized politics. So you're no longer looking at someone over whom you can disagree, and then as soon as you walk out of the town meeting, everything's fine, because hey, it was only the policy about the water or the town's debt. It's, the, it has been folded into bring America back to God. So you're not mistaken about abortion or tax policy. You are an agent of Satan. Well, that puts a whole different deal. Uh, that's sort of a different tone. And, of and I have to be fair, and by the way, I get some criticism of the left in my book, uh, in, in all kinds of blogs as well, having you know, been an equal, uh, an equal opportunity uh, writer in this sense, because I say that there's been a lot of aggravation from the progressive left, who have also played the absolutist culture war dem demonizing game. And, that's, and if anybody who reads Patience for God thinks I'm not fair in my equal treatment of Hitchens and Dawkins and the creationists and the other people, I, I beg to differ because I think I've seen the same, the same blood in your eye fundamentalist zeal in both camps. So it isn't a one-way problem. Once this culture war started, it's something that's been reciprocal. But just to go back to your question again, and I, and I think we'll, we'll probably make that the last question, uh, but I will be out there, but not to be hung, drawn, and quartered. Just be nice, okay? <laughs> um, the, the fact of the matter is, just think about this again. I think it's a good point to end talking about my book, Sucks, Mom, and God. 
when you put a theological twist of absolutism, which projects, by the way, into the eternity. So you're not just voting wrong now, you're burning in hell. <laughs> That's very serious. Uh, and, and so, you know, um, time to take a deep breath. It's just politics. It's just the flesh. Moth and rust corrupt everything. I read that somewhere. <laughs> this isn't terribly serious. We'll all be gone in a minute. You know, the most serious thing I have on my person right now is this little mouse that Lucy handed me on the way out when I said, Lucy, I'll be very lonely. And she said, here, Bob, take this with you. <laughs> so actually, you know, I hate to tell you this, but to me, this is not only a witness and a testimony to what matters to me in life in terms of eternity, but it's where my heart is. You know, my heart is not in being right about everything. And if I'm proved wrong, well, you know, Lucy still loves me. Life goes on, <laughs> and it's going to be done in a minute. And I wasn't right about half the stuff I said anyway. So, um, you know, if you disagree with me, you're not going to hell. You're probably right. Um, <laughs> come back in three years, and I'll agree with you. <laughs> so let's just end there. I'll be at the book table. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you.